Park. Next slide. I was talking about trust. Uh, there's uh, a new study out from TVB, and that's the where they asked uh, people, what, uh, where do you go, wh who do you trust to get your news? You can see where local broadcast TV news is up there. And really look at local newspapers up there at 74%. If you look down at social media, well, you get some problems there. So, uh, and not, not a surprise with all the fake news. Next slide. Uh, this, yeah, this goes into local uh, fake news. I mean, look at uh, uh, Smith Geiger did a survey. They found out that uh, your favorite station for local news is one of your most trusted news brands. Uh, look at uh, Twitter or Facebook down below. Look at Fox News Channel. Look at CNN. Look how low they are compared with the four of us in the product that our great teams deliver on a daily basis. Next. Uh, primary source for news. So TVB asked, uh, what's your primary source? 34% of people say uh, broadcast uh, TV news is still their primary source for uh, getting the news of the day. Next slide. I think this is very important because this came from the Knight Foundation and this just came out a week ago. But between 2009 and 2016, U.S. household TV watching fell about 13.6%. But look at these next two numbers. 88% of that loss was in just eight markets. Obviously, Denver's on there. You've got some huge cities on there. Denver's probably, I uh, know Minneapolis may be the smallest market on there, but uh, Denver, New York City, Dallas. But then look at this. Uh, some markets in showed increases among the key demos. And think of the middle of the country on these, okay? So think of your Cincinnati's, your Columbus, your Nashville, some smaller markets, uh, Reno, Rochester. But I also worked uh, just outside of Kansas City, and so we're all out here fighting for a point and a half, two point ratings. Sometimes Kansas City's getting a five or a six in the, in the key demos. So there are a lot of people in places like St. Louis and Kansas City that are still watching the news and still loving news. So. Um, Last slide. As we look ahead to the next two to three years, these are some of the things we really need to focus on, and I think you'll hear a lot about this today, is how can we be better on our social media apps? How do we make our news apps better? All of us have news apps. All of us are very involved with social media. Uh, and you can look at who's kind of decel decelerating there, and you can see a lot of the national and the cable programs are really struggling. But what you always hear from people is the fake news is not so much in the local, um, local aspect and the local reporting. So I think the four of us up here probably do spend a, a ton of our time making sure that our people are trustworthy and that, uh, they, that we can develop a trust with our community. So I think you'll uh, hear a lot more about that tonight. So thank you for being here. So um, we've seen some facts here that would suggest that there's a future to the business. Uh, if you think about the history of ratings over the last 20, 25 years, there is inevitably, uh, it's hard to get away from the fact that there has been a significant decline of the number of people watching local news, let's say at 10 o'clock at night. If you go back to 1981, uh, the leading station in the market was Channel 9. They had a 25 rating and a 53 share. Uh, so how does that rate to today, Linda? What's, what's your 10, you won 10 o'clock nicely here in the May book, and you did it in an overall household point of view. Uh, a, two a two rating, and uh, with a couple of decimal points in there. So there, there obviously has been a significant decline over time. Um, if you take the position that the bottom has not yet been reached, same sort of thing the newspapers faced a few years ago when everybody felt that maybe the bottom was in sight, and they still haven't found it, uh, how do you react from a business point of view to a further declining audience and fewer and fewer people uh, consuming your product over the air? What, what, what are you going to do about that and how do you manage the assets you have in terms of creating other products that are being consumed in other ways? We'll start. I'd like to hear from each of you. So, Kid Tim, you want to start? Uh, yeah, actually, I want to put a little context on the numbers too because if you hear numbers like that or you read the article that was in Westward today where you see late news was getting a 25 share in 1998 and now it's a this or that. I think it's important to understand just so you, when you read these articles that you understand the context of that. And that is that, you know, our audience is, dem is, is, is uh, measured by share of a total pool of audience. And that pool of audience shifts. These aren't aggregate raw numbers like you see in newspaper circulation or page views. So if in 1998 there were 100 TV viewers and I had a 25 share, I had 25 viewers. 
If in 2018, uh, the pool of viewers is now 500, because we all know Denver has grown, and I have a 10 share, I have 50 viewers. So I'm not saying that that's, those are actual real raw numbers. The reality is that I, before I came over here tonight, just out of curiosity, I pulled 2002, which is 16 years ago. And uh, you know, when you look at the, the shift in the, in the share, it looks pretty dramatic. But the truth is that in, 19, in 2002, we had roughly 100,000 people every night watching our 10 o'clock news, and now we have roughly 70,000 people a night watching our 10 o'clock news. That's a concern for me. I want that to get higher. That's still pretty damn good. And, and I think that you know, when you see these big, sh big shifts, and particularly in shares, you have to just make sure you understand the context of that, particularly in a growing city like Denver. We're still talking about a large number of people you know, watching news. And on a night like last night, you know, when you take just the 10 o'clock newscast alone, at 10 p.m., more than a third uh, of uh, folks with the TV on were watching a newscast. So people are watching the news. Now that said, there is, you know, I shared some data with you that shows there's a, there's a decline. And as Roger and I were talking about before we came in here, you know, the trajectory does point down. And we've got to figure out how to address that, um, both from a financial sense and from a uh, um, business sense, and then, a, you know, how we continue to finance our journalism. Um, the one thing I'll just, you know, I want to share is that, you know, another piece of good news is that the, the, what it costs us to cover the news in television is going down. You know, we, there are now things that are uh, like backpacks, we call them, that allow us to do live shots um, with bonded cellular instead of driving those big trucks around and paying a fortune for satellite costs. Cameras costs are going down, editing costs are going down. You know, those sorts of things do drop to the bottom line and allow us to keep you know, spending money on journalism. So that's another, I think, important piece of context to provide. So that's all I wanted to add to the numbers piece. Any of the rest of you want to respond to that? Go ahead. Well, I would, I would echo exactly what you say. You're talking about the share of the audience last night on a summer night, which was a third of the people, yeah. I think you said. Imagine that if this were 9-11 or Columbine or the Aurora Theater shooting. People come to us for local news. That figure would have probably changed to two thirds, three, you know, what percentage, 75%? I don't, I don't know. I mean, we are still the, the medium that people trust. There is no doubt about that. So yes, are people more active? Do they need, to, do they need us as much on broadcast? No, because they've got their phone all day and they've got digital. But to say that we're declining because our broadcast numbers are down is not accurate to what we do because every single one of us have apps, digital, you know, websites, we're going OTT, like I said. So yes, the broadcast numbers might be declining, but that doesn't mean people aren't consuming what we do. They're consuming it differently. That's the argument that I, I would make. Absolutely, we Close just gotta to figure out how to make money on it. Yeah. yeah, that money thing is a big thing. <laughs> Well, and I think it's also about um, what content. We can't just wait for people to come to us for breaking news, to your point. Yes, people will come if there's a big event, but if there's not, why are they going to come? So we have to, we have to create different kinds of content. My esteemed colleague, Chris Hansen, is sitting here, and I'll call him out for just a second, because he spent two years working on a project that ran on Monday on Memorial Day. It was a half hour of commercial free content um, about veteran suicide. It was one of the most powerful half hours I've seen in a long time. Where's Chris? Chris is right here. Stand up, Chris. Yeah, he should. So I won't talk about what kind of numbers that did because I really don't know because I'm on vacation. Um, <laughs> but um, that was a project that, you know, to continue to invest in that type of of content really makes a difference to the audience. Um, we have, you know, a newer show on our air that some people maybe have seen next with Kyle Clark. The ratings for that show are doing better than some other shows of ours and other people's too. And, and why is that? Um, it's unique content, it's different, we're challenging the audience, we're using the audience. 
I've never worked on a show in Denver that you get 50 to 100 emails from the audience during a show and as many, you know, Twitter reactions. So if we keep listening back to listening to the audience, obviously we're doing some things that people really like. Nicole Bapp is here, who's the head of our investigative unit. Some very, yep, give Nicole a, a round of applause. Um, you know, this type of content are the, uh, the things that the audience responds to because we can't really just sit and expect them no offense, Tom Green, to show up at four and five o'clock every day <laughs> to find out what's happening. You know, to your point, Holly, obviously people know what's happening and we just can't expect people to come and not get some context or some commentary or be challenged or have their content be part of the conversation. Uh, you know, that's how we, we, you know, how we monetize that. That's somebody else's question. <laughs> I just think uh, Linda hit on something really uh, important, and that's unique content. And I think that that is uh, so important to what we do on a daily basis. And that means that uh, maybe we're spending less people and less resources on that Governor Hickenlooper news conference in the middle of uh, US 34 um, today. And we're finding uh, time to let our uh, fantastic storytellers get out and tell different stories. Do, do we always do the best job of it? Um, probably not, and we can always do better. And I think that is so important important that we find ways to find that unique content and market it as best we can to our viewers um, on a daily basis. So uh, Brian, would it, would it be fair to say that you're probably happy that you've dodged the Sinclair bullet? <laughs> well, full disclosure, we haven't totally dodged it, you know. That's why I yes. say. That's what I say. You appear to have. Well, I, we think uh, Sinclair will own Channel Two, though. So yeah. um, Fox will own Thirty One, and it'll be uh, Sinclair will own Channel Two, probably on a um, kind of a um, duopoly kind of a basis. So Sinclair will still have some part of the operation. I don't think they'll have as much editorial control with Fox. So. Yes, full disclosure, I don't know if I should say this, but it's fantastic. I think it'll be great to be a Fox o and I think that that's a benefit and that's something that I hadn't planned for. But truthfully, I took this job knowing a little bit about Sinclair. The problem is Sinclair has kind of stepped on themselves over the past two months and they've been a PR nightmare. So uh, they have really struggled. So yes, uh, long answer to a question, uh, we're happy. Well, just, just, just to have that? a little... I, if Scott Livingston is going to see this, I might be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so. I know. Just to have a little fun, let's theoretically assume for the rest of you, the three of you, that Sinclair were going to acquire your station. How would you respond to what you know about them at this point? And, of course, you've come I'd go close. across the street. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Tim, you want to weigh into that? <laughs> no, I think I, th I think truly one of the things I will say is that there's been a lot of this discussion in, in the Sinclair uh, controversy. Why doesn't everybody just quit their jobs and move on? And I think that's a naive response to it. I think so. that you have to appreciate that you know each newsroom is unique, each situation is unique. The market, the you have contract situations. People are still in jobs and. They would need to find other jobs that support themselves or their families. And, um, you know, truthfully, to answer your question, I think 